found that. If you're willing and able, you can stand with us. We'll read some scripture together. In Luke chapter 24, I told our Sunday school class this morning, this is probably one of my most favorite chapters in the Bible. It just has everything you could want in it. And I love this chapter. Luke chapter 24, uh, let's begin reading in verse number 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Now, it's not the message this morning, but it is possible to look for Jesus in the wrong place. It is possible to go to a place where Jesus once was to find him, but he no longer be there. And you can look for Christ in the wrong place. Verse number 6, He's not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales and they believed them not. I hope the resurrection doesn't seem an idle tale to you. Not the message this morning, but I do hope that you did not come here with a mind of of mockery. I do hope that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is as literal to you as the sunrise, because it is. Amen. Verse number 12, Then arose Peter and ran into the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. And behold, two of them went the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. That's about seven to eight miles. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk? And say the last three words out loud with me. And are sad. And are sad. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you will make yourself real to everyone in this room. Lord, I pray that you will speak. Lord, as I make an appeal to these people's hearts, I pray that the Word of God will penetrate their hearts. Sometimes life makes us hard. Sometimes awful events make us sad. Sometimes things we never thought would ever happen, happen and leave us discouraged, maybe even a little bit angry. God, I I know that there might be some people in this church this morning that came in Sad. It's a beautiful day. It's Resurrection Sunday. It's, it's a happy day, but Lord, we may not all be happy. And I, I pray this morning that the Word of God will be real and will pierce to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And I, I pray that the Word of God can, can pierce our hearts this morning and speak to us. Touch us where we're the weakest. Touch us where we are the most bitter. Touch us where we are the most angry. And where we are the most confused, touch us where we are the saddest. Lord, I pray that you will do that now, which only you can. As the great shepherd of the sheep, I ask that you lead us to the still waters and to the green pastures and nourish our soul. Give every one of us in the room wisdom above ourselves. Give us each eyes to see and ears to hear, that we may behold wondrous things in thy law. Lord, I pray now that you bind my mind and bind my tongue. Lord, give me clarity. And speak through me this morning in the name of Jesus and the church said amen. Amen. You can be seated. Here are two disciples 
walking down the road talking about something that has happened with Jesus. It is this preacher's opinion. This is a married couple. In verse 18, it gives us the name of one of them. His name is Cleopas. So we know one of them is a man named Cleopas. In John chapter 19 and verse 25, it's speaking of the women that came to the cross. And it says that one of them was Mary, the wife of Cleopas. And so we know that Cleopas was there. We know that a lady married to Cleopas named Mary was there. And here's two disciples walking home and they live together. I'm just going to step on a limb and just say that this is a married couple. You are allowed to disagree. This is a free country. But I believe this is a married couple on their way home from the crucifixion. And they are completely depressed. They are completely discouraged. Their entire world has, has, has fallen apart and, and they're on their way home. And, and, and so Jesus joins them. And, and what an amazing thing that Christ came, took time out of His resurrected ministry to come walk down a dirt road with a married couple who were sad. And so He comes down and begins to speak with them. And He asks them a very simple question. What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? Basically, he said, hey, what's wrong with y'all? You know, what's the matter? What's going on? Is everything all right? That's how we would kind of talk. We would say, hey, what's up? Everything good? Are you okay? You got, any, got, got, got something on your mind? You look sad. And so Jesus comes and he begins to talk with him. And, uh, and we notice in verse number 14 and 15 that this, this couple, first they, they exchanged. They were exchanging thoughts. It says that the, they commune together and they talk together. And so... You know what it means to have communication? It means to exchange statements. It means to exchange thoughts or opinions. And so this couple's walking home exchanging their thoughts about what had happened. But they weren't just exchanging. They were trying to explain it. In verse number 15, it says that they reasoned. They reasoned. And so they're trying to explain away what's just happened. Their entire life has just stopped on a dime. The one they thought was going to be the king and the one they thought was going to change uh, how the world was going, the one they thought that was going to overturn the Roman government. I mean, they had all these expectations and all of a sudden now they're gone because Jesus is dead. And they're trying to explain away their disappointments. Have you ever done that with your spouse? You've gotten the worst news you've ever gotten. Brother Steve and Miss Vicky, they got a phone call several months ago and they said, the doctor's report has come back and, and we're sorry to say, but Brother Steve has cancer. That's a terrible phone call to get. No one expects that phone call. No one wakes up expecting, the day's the day I'm going to be told I have a deathly disease and I may not survive. No one expects that. And when that does happen, we are, we are sad and we talk about it, but we try to explain it. We try to find some solid ground. We try to find some type of, some type of solid fact, something foundational, something just to make us feel better. And I believe that's what this couple's doing. They're, they're, they're trying to explain what happened, Brother Doug. They're trying to find some type of solid ground to stand on. Say amen if you've ever been there before. But then they entertained. In verse number 15, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Jesus joined their conversation. And now they are entertaining Jesus. He is part of their company now. Hebrews chapter uh, 13 and verse number 2 says that some have entertained angels unawares. And, uh, and though Jesus Christ is the Son of God and not necessarily an angel, but, but here Jesus is walking with them and they don't even know it. And Jesus has joined their conversation. And He begins to speak with them and talk with them. And He asks them, why are you sad? Why are you sad? Verse number 18, if you've still got your Bible open, say amen. amen. Verse number 18, And one of them whose name was Cleopas answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? He says, Man, where have you been? <laughs> where have, have you been under a rock in Siberia? That's kind of how we would say it today. Where have you been? Have you not heard the news? Have you not seen what's happened in town? And Jesus responds in verse number 19, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. They said, Have you not heard that Jesus, this prophet that did all these miracles, spoke all these things, has been delivered by our rulers and been crucified? Verse 21, here's the kicker. Here's why they're sad. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. 
I said, man, we thought this was going to be our Messiah. We thought he was going to be our Redeemer. We thought he was going to come and kick Rome in the teeth and we were going to be free from this bondage that we are in. You know what happened? They were disappointed. They were disappointed. Jesus did come, but he did not do what they wanted him to do. And Jesus is speaking to some disappointed disciples. They're disappointed. They, have, they are let down. Their expectations have not been met. What they hoped and dreamed for God to do, God did not do it, and they're disappointed. He says that we trusted that it had been He. We trusted that it was Him. So it's past tense. So they did trust Him, but now they don't trust Him. They no longer trust Jesus because of what had happened. It says this is the third day since all this has happened. So for three days they have not trusted Jesus. They have not trusted God. Not because He lied to them, but because He didn't do what they thought He was going to do. And they were disappointed. And I believe <coughs> I'm doing the same thing as Jesus. I believe I'm speaking to people. You're a believer. I mean, you're at church on Resurrection Sunday. Why else would you be here? But you're disappointed in something that God has done. Or disappointed in something that God has not done. I mean, yes, it's Resurrection Sunday, preacher. We know Jesus is alive, and that's all great. Love the song, sing on, it's a blessing. But he hasn't answered my prayer in about two years, and to be honest with you, I'm a little bit chapped about it. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit discouraged because God has disappointed me. There are some things I really expected God to have done by now, and he's not done it. I'm disappointed. God has allowed this into my life. God could have stopped it, but God didn't stop it. And I'm disappointed. Can you be that honest this morning to say that you're disappointed? I've been there before. Let down. Had high expectations that God was going to do something and then not do it. I mean, pray a prayer so earnest. I mean, and have it phrased, Brother Williams, so eloquently and so concisely and prayed it with tears streaming down my face and then God, I'll answer it. I mean, you can't help but be disappointed. I'm not beating anybody up this morning. I hope you don't feel that way. But this couple on the Emmaus Road, they were disappointed. God did not do what they thought God was going to do. And they were disappointed. And so when Jesus got there, he said, why are you all sad? Because they were sad. They were sad. They were disappointed and sad. Sadness is a real thing, is it not? And when something we hope happens, when something we think God Almighty is doing, I mean, for three and a half years, Jesus Christ walked on this earth. He spoke messianic messages. He fulfilled prophecy. He performed miracles. He did everything that Messiah was supposed to do. And then he went and died on them. Man, they were disappointed. And they were sad. Now, get this. Standing in front of of them was the resurrected Son of God. Like, in the flesh. Like, Brother Thomas, I'm standing just a few feet from you. Close enough to have a personal conversation. You can hear me speak from right here. They're in this type of presence with the resurrected Son of God. And they're sad. They're in the presence of a living Savior who has died and come back from the dead. And they're sad. You see, you can be with Jesus and be sad at the same time, Brother Bo. You can be at church. You can be hearing preaching, hearing songs, worshiping. You can be in the presence of the Spirit of God and be sad at the same time. You see, it happens every week, not just on Resurrection Sunday. It happens every service. Scott, people come in, parents come in. I know you're young, but parents come in with late bills, mortgage about to be due, and they ain't got no money. Maybe their marriage is struggling. Maybe their kid is sick. They've got trials and heartaches. And you know what? They come to church, and they hear the preaching. They hear the Bible. They hear the same songs, and we worship. They're still sad. And God hasn't answered a prayer. God hasn't come through in a particular way or on a, in a particular time, and, and, and we're sad. And we're sad. Look, there's nothing wrong with being sad. There's nothing wrong with being sad. Living the saved life is not cupcakes and beds of roses and, and 
curly fries all the time. Man, sometimes, sometimes life is hard. And sometimes you pray a prayer and you hope God does something and sometimes it don't happen. And you walk away sad. They were sad. Let me hurry. They were sad because of what was done. In verse number 20, they said, Man, our chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. I said, Can you believe what these people have done? <coughs> Excuse me. Someone has done something awful. And it's changed how they look at Jesus. Look, look what happens. In verse 20, our chief rulers, our chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. What was done by someone else changed what they thought about Jesus Christ. The extremely sinful actions of other people changed how they looked at God. The extremely sinful actions of other people changed how they looked at God. Now tell me if you've never been there before. Someone has done something so terribly sinful and it has changed how you look at God. Something that directly affected you. Something you were completely opposed to and completely against. And it's changed how you look at God. The actions of others. And God allowed it to happen. How could God? How could God have done, let something like this happen? How could He... Is He really here? Is He really who He said He was? Can He really do what He said He can do? Maybe not. Because look what so-and-so has done. And we walk away from it disappointed. Not in them, but in Him. We don't walk away disappointed in that, that sick, sinful, wicked uncle. We don't walk away disappointed in that awful politician. We walk away disappointed in God. Because God allowed it to happen. And we get angry with Him. It makes us sad. And even when we come to church and feel the presence of God, and, and sing the songs, and hear the sermon, and read the Bible, even in all of that, we're still sad. We're still a disappointed disciple. I mean, you're a disciple. You believed Him. You sure are disappointed. They were disappointed. They were sad and, by what was done, but they were also sad by the days. By the days. In verse number 21, they said, And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. <laughs> beside all of this, it's taken too long to fix. It's been three days. It's over. I mean, he's for sure dead. I mean, he's like really dead. It's been, he's been buried for three days. He ain't coming back. Man, they've been, they've been upset about the what. Now they're upset about the when. Because now they're carrying a burden... One they didn't expect to ever be carrying, but now they've carried it far too long. You ever been there? I made a statement the other night in a message. I said, I can handle a really bad night. You know, when you have a bad night, you have a bad problem, but, you know, you go to bed and wake up and it's gone, I can handle that. But when I wake up and the problem's still there, and then I go to bed again and it's there, and I wake up again and it's there, and, and it just don't seem to go away, well, now i got a problem. You ever been disappointed because God has not come through on the time that you thought He should have? But then they were upset. They were sad about the disappearance. In verse 22, they said, Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not His body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels and said that He was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said. But him they saw not. Now they're saying, we can't even find God anymore. Now Jesus is gone. He's, now they don't even know where he's at. So they've got a problem with the what, they've got a problem with the when, and now they've got a problem with the where. It just seems like, can't nobody find God. Can't nobody find him. And he's gone. 
I've got a problem with the what, with the where and the when. Now, in verse number 22, I just, I just find this, this just touched me and I almost kind of found it humorous as well as aggravating. They said, certain of our women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they had found not his body, they came saying they had seen a vision of angels which said he was alive. Certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. You ever get aggravated when you come to church and you're, you're upset with the Lord, you're disappointed and you're frustrated because you can't find Him and you come in and some old grandmother is up there just praising God, saying she's talked to God today and, and she's excited God's answered her prayer and you just look at them and think, He ain't answered mine. I mean, yeah, y'all seen Him, but I ain't. That ever, get, that ever frustrate you? That ever bother you? I, I, it's almost aggravating. Like, why them? How come they get to know where God is, but I don't? How come they get to know? Well, the Wayne, why do they get their prayer answered, but not me? That ain't Amen. fair. Man, won't we get disappointed with God? They were sad. Number two, they were slow. <laughs> they were slow. <coughs> I, don't mean, I don't mean that offensive. That's just what Jesus said in verse number 25. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now they have vented to Jesus, and he's going to respond. And you know what he said? He said, you're slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Say, so what does that mean? They believed that the prophets had spoken, that a redeemer would come and would set up a, a kingdom, would sit on a throne, and it would be a literal, tangible government. They believed that because the prophets said it. But that's not all the prophets said. See, the prophets also said that that Savior would come, Isaiah 53, as a lamb led before the slaughter, as a shearer is dumb, he, he, that lamb would die. So they didn't believe everything that he said. You know what they found out? They found out that God and them were not on the same page. They found out that they were not on the same page with God. They were slow. They were a little bit behind. They missed some things. They missed some things. They left out some doctrine. They left out some doctrine. He said, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? See, they believed the parts that they wanted, the part that fit their hopes and their dreams. But passages like Isaiah 53 did not fit in their hopes and dreams. That did not fit what they wanted. They wanted a superior nation to topple their enemy, not a sinful nation that needed a Savior to die for their sin. So they, they, they skipped some doctrine. But a sinful nation is in need of a dying Redeemer way more than a free government. You see, everyone look this way. I don't want you to miss this statement. Here's what was wrong. Here's what was wrong. They wanted the best blessings from their Messiah in this life, not the next one. You see, Christ was their Messiah. Amen. But Christ did not come to set up a kingdom. You see, the cross was not plan B. It was not a fallback plan. Dying for sin was not just plan B because the Jews rejected and plan A didn't work. No, friend. Jesus came to die. That was the plan. All right? Because he came to wash their sins away, not set up a better society. That'll come later. But they wanted the biggest blessing from God in this life, not the next one. And that's where almost every American Christian finds themselves today. Is we want God's best blessings now. I mean, heaven is great and all, but sometimes, if you'd be real honest, you would rather, instead of having a mansion, have a double wide if it meant you could have a mansion now. You'd rather, you'd rather have a double wide in heaven and have a mansion here because we want the biggest, the biggest and best blessings. We want them now in this life. And when that doesn't happen, 
And when God doesn't give us the things that we want so badly, boy, we get disappointed. And then when He gives it to somebody else, Mm. Now we're on thin ice. We're on thin ice, aren't we? We start getting real frustrated. You know what it does? It changes the dynamic of our relationship with our Savior because He has disappointed us and He has not done what we expected Him to do. You see, we want God to be God on our terms. We want God to be God on our terms. We want Him to do God things when we ask Him to do God things. We want to pick what He does. I'm not trying to beat anybody up. I know know it's Resurrection Sunday and we're supposed to be very happy and positive. We're getting there if you'll just stay with me. But before this couple on the Emmaus Road could get there, they had to be corrected first. And oftentimes we want our best blessings from our Savior in this life, not the next one. They left out His doctrine. They left out His death. I mean, He had to die. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? This had to happen. But they also left out His defeat. Look at the last phrase of verse 26. Look at the last phrase of verse 26. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to what? Enter into His glory. What glory? The glory they're thinking of is the glory on the throne. Scepter and all that, crowns and and dominion and principality, government, all those things. That's not the glory He's talking about. The glory He's talking about is He's just defeated death. See, they wanted Him to defeat Rome. All right. Kill Caesar, get rid of Caesar and Herod and and Pilate, get rid of those guys. But instead of defeating them, he defeated death. He defeated hell. He defeated Satan. He defeated a much bigger enemy than Rome. He defeated death. Oh, death, hey, death, where's your sting? I'll tell you where it is. Jesus took it from you. Where's your victory, grave? I'll tell you where it is. Jesus stole it from him. Jesus beat them. Jesus beat a much bigger enemy than they had thought. Revelation chapter 1, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. You know when that happened? That happened in Luke 24 when he resurrected from the grave. They want him to defeat a tangible enemy. They wanted him to defeat a government enemy, not death. So they were sad and they were slow. And look, If on Resurrection Sunday you and God get on the same page, that will be the greatest day in your life. The greatest day in your life is when you and God get on the same page. When you and God get on the same page and you are okay with God being God no matter what happens. When you and God get on the same page. See, they were sad, they were slow, but in the end of this thing, they were sure. They were sure. In verse number 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And if I could go back in time to one moment in the Bible history, it would probably be right there. Because I want to hear Jesus preach himself from the books of Moses. I want to hear Jesus talking about how he's the real brazen serpent, how he's the real sacrifice, how he's the real lamb. I want to I want to hear Jesus talk about that. That would be amazing. But in verse number 28, And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them, and it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. <laughs> he's done it again. He's disappeared. <laughs> See, they were frustrated earlier because he's disappeared. Now he's disappeared again. But this time it's different. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and then that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. You see, they were sad. And they were slow, but now they're sure. Now they're confident in Christ. But look, look this way. 
they still never got what they wanted. Israel ain't no more free from Rome than it was the day before. Matter of fact, Rome will be destroyed in less than 30 years. I mean, Jerusalem will be destroyed in less than 30 years by Rome. They never got what they wanted. They never got the expectation that they were after. But something has changed in them. They never got their expectation, that thing they wanted God to do. They never got it. But they walked away as confident and as sure in Christ as they could have. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Paul probably did not have the ministry he thought he would have. He spent one-third of his ministry in a jail cell. He was beaten multiple times, stoned and left for dead. Over and over, read 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He gives his autobiography of the things that he went through. Awful things, things nobody wants to experience. But he said, I'm going through these things and I may have never expected it, but I'm not ashamed because I know in whom I have believed. And these, these, this, this couple from the Emmaus Road comes back to the 11 and says, we may be disappointed that there's no kingdom. We may be sad that there's no throne and we're not ruling and reigning yet. Rome's still over us and we're still in bondage. But I know in whom I have believed. The Lord is risen indeed. They've gone from sad to slow to sure. Many people are disappointed in Christ, disappointed in God, because He's not done what they wanted. He's not, they've not done what He expected. They've, they're disappointed. I don't want you to leave sad or slow. I want you to leave sure that Jesus Christ is alive and that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is, he is living and He is God. Look, look in their verse, in verse 34. They said, The Lord is risen indeed. So first... They were, they were positive and they were confident in his position. They said, the Lord is risen. See, earlier they called him Jesus of Nazareth. They called him a prophet. Now they're calling him the Lord. Look, and now don't get sideways with me. He's still not the king. Y'all understand that? He's still not the king. There's no throne. I mean, there's one in heaven, but it ain't down here. Look, Rome's still there. He's still not the king. And he may not be everyone's king, but he is my Lord. And he may not be the king of this world, and everyone may not be subject to him and bowing down to him and doing what he says. He may not be controlling everything, but he is my Lord, and I'm sure of that. I'm sure of that. I'm sure of his position. He's my Lord. He is my Savior, and I know that he is alive. I know that he is my Lord. You can leave knowing in whom I have believed. Things may not be going the way that you want them to go. You may be disappointed in the what's. You may not understand the why's. You may be angry about the wins, but you can know the who. Jesus Christ. They were sure about his position. They were also sure of his power. They said the Lord is risen indeed. I mean, these people watched him die, but now are certain that he has the power to come back from the dead. You see, faith is not based in knowing you can get what you want. Faith is based in knowing that God can do what nobody else can. Faith is not based in getting what you want. Sadly, many have reduced it to that. God is good as long as God answers my request. But that's not what makes God God. That's not what makes faith, faith. Faith is not based in getting your way. Faith is based in believing that God can do what nobody else can. They walked away sure of his position, of his power. But lastly, they walked away sure of his proof. Miss Leslie, could you come to the piano this morning? They said, the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared unto Simon. He hath appeared unto Simon. You see, Jesus Christ, he made 11 appearances after the resurrection. He appeared to Simon Peter one-on-one. -on -one. We learn that from, from, from the book of Acts and the book of Corinthians. Jesus 
appeared to Simon personally, face to face. And so when they showed up, they said, the Lord is risen. They said, the Lord, the, His position, He's risen indeed, His power. But then they gave some proof. And they said, He's also appeared to Simon. So they said, point to Simon, and Simon will say, yes, Jesus is alive. You see, five times in the book of Acts, in chapter 2, in chapter 3, in chapter 5, in chapter 10, five different times Peter claims this title, I am his witness. I am the witness to his resurrection. I know that Jesus came back from the dead because I saw him. I am his witness. He claimed that title five different times. You know what he's doing? Brother Bo, he's saying, yes, he's alive. You can trust him. That's the truth. They, God gave him a man, a flesh and blood man, just like you and me, to look him in the eyes and say, yes, he is alive. I've seen him. I know that he's real. I am his witness. And you can trust him. Even though the things you wanted did not happen, you can trust him because I've seen him and I know he's alive. May I be your witness this morning and tell you that even though you may not have gotten the desires of your heart, you can trust Him. May I be His witness to you this morning, Brother Chris, and tell you that even when you can't get that prayer answered on the time schedule, you would like to have it answered, that Jesus Christ is still God, He is still alive, He still loves you, He still cares for your family, He still loves your children, He still has your best interest at heart, and He will still take care of you. May I be his witness for you this morning and tell you, you can trust God. He is alive. He's not a liar. He's not dead. He's not like the others. He, uh, he and he alone are his God, and he is in control. Amen. May I be Peter for you this morning and say, I stand as proof. Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ answered prayer. Jesus Christ loves sinners. He saves sinners, of whom I am chief. And Jesus Christ can be trusted. Many may have walked into church this morning disappointed, sad about something God has done or has not done. And you just can't seem to get your mind around it. You see, defeating disappointment, it's not about getting your way and making God yield to your will. Defeating disappointment is about trusting Jesus more when you don't get your way. That's how you defeat disappointment. It's not in getting your favorite answer. And I'm not belittling anyone's problem, anyone's prayer request, anyone's trial. I'm not belittling any of that. But the answer to overcoming disappointment in God is not in getting your way. It's about learning to trust Him even when you don't. Some disappointed disciples. Let's stand to our feet this morning.